Is that recording? Hey, we are recording. We are live. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful subject to uh, to unite people around the world under how to engage children in permaculture. So I guess, um, yeah, where to really start would be, um, well, why do we need to engage children in permaculture? And I guess there's a couple of parts to that. First of all, what is permaculture? And maybe before then, is what what's wrong with the current way of educating children? Why does it need to change? So maybe let's start there. Um, so yeah, anyone who knows me in my in my in person workshops, a lot of my workshop is uh, is not about teaching anything, but it's about asking questions to help you to understand for yourself and for you to uncover and learn things yourself so sometimes it works on zoom sometimes it doesn't depends on the group uh so let's try it though um because i'd really like you to to participate as much as you can because i feel that's that's where you really get much more understanding of a subject rather than just being passively listening so, yeah, so what's some of the challenges that we face with the modern way of educating our young people? So feel free to um, unmute yourselves and speak. Maybe you'd like to put your hands up first if you feel more comfortable to do that, to be invited. Children are cooped up in school. Someone is typing in uh, Fosia. Um, yeah, I must admit, I I totally failed the school system. I, I couldn't understand why they would put me inside this room with all these, you know, while there's so much amazing stuff happening outside and I'm stuck inside. And and it and by the age of 12, I worked out the system, how I could actually look like I was in school without actually having to go to any classes. So, and I spent most of my time sitting in a in a park uh, actually up a tree hiding waiting for the truant officers to run by as soon as they're gone I could just walk home so I spent a lot of time just watching and seeing people and watching nature and it was really magical a bit more problematic when um, in the winter when all the leaves fell off there wasn't so many places to hide but but still we managed to make it all the way through so um, yeah just just the environment in which education takes place is really unnatural and unhealthy what else the, oh, uh, da, da, da. yeah exactly children are away from nature um what other things so this disconnection from nature is, is a really primary thing what else is what are our, some of the other challenges Maybe we can look at it from the perspective of where does it leave our children? You know, where, what do they end up learning? What practices? What, um, the education. yeah, what, what do they, yeah, go for it. Who's the education about? system isn't, it doesn't environmentally teach, it doesn't teach, well, it, it teaches the environmental skills, but not to a point of them recognizing the parts that of them which is going to increase their well-being if you like yeah so... I'm not having access but also it's just not taught yeah so so we're we're taught pretty much how to use nature as a resource as something that we can make use of because we are superior to it we're more intelligent than it and we will um yeah in you know our exert our power over nature and take all the resources to do all uh, incredible things with it because we are more powerful in it so it really uh teaches or encourages everyone to really believe that we can exploit um yeah exploit nature resources whether it's animals insects plants or natural resources so I'm just checking if anyone else is typing in um, some of the introductions, which is great. Uh, children have no idea where food comes from. 
Uh, some grow up thinking potatoes grow on trees. Don't they grow on trees? Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's... Um, yeah, <laughs> and maybe some adults also <laughs> genuinely don't have a clue where their 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 food actually comes from, and um, yeah, so it's not just our children. Um, so yeah, so for me, the, some of the my ah, Bo, Bo Edwards, would you like to? Hello, everyone. I'm Bo. Um, nice to meet you. All. Yeah, I just had a thought reading some of the um the messages in the chat that as well as, um, you know, children and all of us being cut off from nature by classrooms and that, um, yeah, people, we don't learn how, you know, kind of like to recognize nature and how it exists actually in the real world. There's also being outside the classroom, collect people to their local space in a, in, in, in a very useful way. So I guess that you could learn about biology or the natural world within a classroom but it's like to be quite like a standardized curriculum that is true maybe across lots of different spaces and through going outside you can learn actually about the the, the place you exist in and the people involved in it and you know whether it's like the the, the native plants of that area or the, the climate there or just like yeah like quite con good contextual knowledge that's harder to get in the classroom brilliant yeah we'll certainly start to uncover how we can start in encouraging that exactly exactly uh but yes yeah, so some of the challenges as we've said is really this disconnect from ourselves and our relationship to nature to others to you know um at the end of the day you know we live on uh, a really amazing planet you know if, if we think about the probability of this planet actually being able to exist you know all the incredibly billions of things that have to happen in order for a planet to give life let alone I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that I would completely call ourselves an intelligent life forms, but uh, as, as potentially a, intelligent life forms such as human beings. You know, for us, for it to to exist um, is so improbable. And yet here we are. Here we are. All the incredible things, you know, the planet in exactly the right uh, trajectory and the right um orbit around a, a, a sun you know a little bit closer we'd be fried a little bit further away we'd be frozen um and i think it was one of the i think a, a huge asteroid hit the moon which um which jolted its position which completely changed our tra trajectory and so many things had to happen for us to be exactly where we are and for life to be able to begin and what an incredible journey and um and, yeah, and that the planet has created an ecosystem that allows so much incredible diversity. And yet through, you know, our modern way of living um, and through this paradigm of us believing that we are superior to nature. And, it's you know, and in some cultures, even to the point where it is pretty much the paradigm that we are that you know we were given this planet so that we could do what we like to it we are superior to it uh we can see where that mentality has led to the exploitation as say of people of land of nature and so on and so forth and and say and this the, the modern education system is designed to deliver that mentality so that those in power, those with the money, can continue to exploit, can continue to, um, you know, disconnect and not even see the repercussions of their actions. You know, I think this is probably the thing that I disagreed with school the most, because when the teachers were telling me certain things, you know, they told me I should tell the truth. My parents also told me I should tell the truth. So when I saw my teachers lying to me, I said, excuse me, sir, but that's nonsense. That's not how the world is. The world is like this. Why are you telling me that? Bang! And I'd be physically beaten for telling the truth, for trying to point out to the teacher that he's got it completely wrong. Uh, sorry, my computer's gone a bit crazy. Uh, I hope you're still there. Yep. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so in me telling the truth because I could see these patterns I could see this incredible interconnectedness 
which my teachers couldn't even begin to understand existed. And, and they're teaching me in a really empirical way of just little bits here, little bits there, completely disconnected from everything else. So if you change this, all right, you may be able to exploit and get a lot of something from here, but can't you see how that's totally destroying and degrading that over there? How is it you can't see that? So as I grew up, I, I became really, you know, I say I, I failed. I, I never went to school effectively and I failed every single exam because uh, I didn't even know what the subjects were that they were trying to get me to test me on. And um, and but I was still able to see the world for what it is. And this, for me, gave me a huge advantage. People now say, how come you know so much? And my question is, how come you don't know so much? You know, all I did, all I'm doing is I'm just seeing what's in front of my eyes and um, and not comparing it to a flawed model that tries to disconnect me from the repercussions of my actions. And so. So, yes, yeah, so so this is my kind of starting point. So when it for me, when it comes to, you know, the, the, the big challenge of how we educate our children, it really, um, you know, one of the main things is that we, we really need to look after the planet that we're living on, as well as all the animals, the insects and all other human beings. Um, and so to cultivate this kind of love. The only way that you, you know, when you cultivate love, when you know something when you know about it when you have a relationship with that thing whatever it might be so to cultivate love of nature you need to have a relationship with nature you need to connect to it you need to feel it touch it smell it use all of your senses and really begin to just be in complete awe of nature's beauty and how can you do that in a classroom when you're disconnected from it when even your teachers are scared to let you out in into nature and uh you know uh it's uh, and your teachers don't understand nature you, you know the teachers don't go out they they're scared of insects and spiders and um you know a little bit of rain and so you know and the parents are you know, because they've been brought up that way as well, are also quite disconnected. And so so everything that the children are learning are all the patterns from the elders, uh, which is predominantly uh, that nature is dirty. Nature is dangerous. Nature is, you know, unclean and so on and so forth. So, um so how do we reverse that? How do we start getting, you know, uh, young people and adults back into nature so that they can start connecting? So that that's really the first thing. Now, we. OK, so, so we recognize that we really need to get um, yeah, children to say out into nature and really connecting and really seeing all these incredible interactions between animals and insects and plants and 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 really falling in love with and really understanding how you know it works because of diversity and one of the main challenges that we face on the planet right now is this biodiversity loss everyone talks about climate change as if that's the only problem that there is almost and obviously there's a lot of um, a lot of science that some prove that it is uh, a real thing some proving it's not a real thing and you know, so much confusion around what the reality is. Uh, but the fact, really, for me, that what is more important is the biodiversity loss, because it's the biodiversity in the environment, in this planet, that actually makes this planet um, thrive and, and allows us to live on this planet. Once we destroy that diversity, that biodiversity, then we've got huge problems. And so five or 10 key species dying out can have a, a, be a really, you know, can be devastating. But the scientists are saying that 
something like between half a million to one million species of animals, insects, plants, bacteria are going to go extinct in the next 40, 50 years because of our human actions. That's way beyond devastating. That is that that is, you know, that we're in a really critical state. So really, we need to really see how we can reverse this. So how do we really embrace more animals, insects and, um, you know, more biodiversity in our systems? And as I say, this is really what we need to be teaching our young. And so we, you know, the, the title of this is how to engage children in permaculture. So I guess what we really need to now look at is, well, what is permaculture? So we see the problem. So if we now look at what is permaculture and then how does that help to solve things? And then we can look at, well, how is it that we can uh, engage children in permaculture? You know, uh, because obviously, depending on the age group, you know, it's uh, pedagogically very different between a three and a six year old compared to a seven and 11 year old compared to a 12, you know, up to, to adulthood. So it's um, different ways in which we can engage. So that's what we'd like to explore by the end of this. So, um, yeah, what is permaculture? I'm sure a few of you have done permaculture courses. I know, George, you've done a permaculture teacher training course with me. And um, but would anyone else like to say what? So Lisa Marie is saying it's a design system. OK, in the chat. Anyone like to advance that design? And so, all right, let me ask it a different way. What do you currently think permaculture is? And so whatever you think it is, is correct, because that's what you think it is. I'm not asking you for a dictionary definition. I'm what do you think permaculture is? Feel free to unmute yourselves and, and speak. So, um, Noli, raising an ecosystem as opposed to a crop. All right. A design system that creates sustainable and regenerative relationships. Beautiful. A way of seeing, a way of being. Fantastic. I love it. Anything else? Anyone else want to? Harmony. Ooh. Cool. So my rather tongue-in-cheek definition of permaculture is uh, permaculture is just common sense. But it's common sense for a world where sense is no longer common. So for me, you know, the fact that we take care of our environment, you know, that we look after the, the very being, the very entity that affords us life and don't destroy it, don't deplete it, don't, uh, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you. I think that's that's a common saying, isn't it? Um, you know, the, the, for me, that's just common sense that we really take care of our environment we really take care of our surroundings and so all the things that we do you know that have some kind of repercussion to our surroundings you know whether it's animals insects plants uh, soil life and so on and so forth you know the water the air anything that that we do that destroys depletes degrades that is not taking care of our surroundings and um and, you know, uh, in, including not taking care of human beings, other humans, you know, and exploiting them. So for me, it's really it's just common sense that we take care of these things, because the more we take care of nature, the more nature will take care of us. The more we take care of other human beings, the more they will take care of us. So it's it's reciprocal. You know, you you know, the more you give, the more you get. And, um, you know, the, the, the more you can give to the world, the more the world will take care of you. Uh, the more you just take from the world and take, 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 the more you exploit, the more disconnected you are from other people. The more disconnected you are and the more greedy, the more selfish you become. And, um, you know, we can see, we can see the repercussions of that. So, so permaculture for me is, uh, as has been said in the, in the chat, it's about really 
finding ways for us to go back to really taking care of our well, of our environment and other people but doing it you know or let's let's start maybe a different way is how to meet our needs in a way that takes care of nature that enriches nature that takes care of other human beings that uh, you know that really enriches the lives um, of others so how is it you know so we can then start looking at well what do we mean by our needs so there's food needs there's um you know housing education transportation economics there's uh, mental health and well-being spiritual health and well-being all of these things you know and many 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 more um you know are some of our needs so how do we meet these needs in a way that instead of depleting destroying um or exploiting actually enriches and makes more rich more abundant more vibrant so that everyone else can also live and and be healthy and so for me this is what permaculture is it's a design methodology that helps us to very very carefully very very um yeah very completely consider all of the repercussions of our actions so if we're designing a food growing system as has been said in the chat we grow it in a way that it's regenerative that it actually encourages animals and insects and biodiversity it enriches the soils and the the life around us um you know but also uh how how do we do it that you know in such a way that it takes care of other humans as well so so the basic uh um foundation if you like of permaculture is it's a design methodology that has ethics at its very very heart so is it good for the earth earth care is it good for people people care and are we only taking out of the system what the system can genuinely giving us and returning all the surplus back into the system so that the system can regenerate and become richer and stronger and more vibrant, which is called fair share. So permaculture is, uh, is a design methodology that really helps us to design uh, meeting our needs in a way that also takes care of others and takes care of, of our surroundings. So the question is, how do we uh, get this really beautiful idea and concept across to our children? How do we uh, engage children in a way that they really feel this and this just becomes part of their nature? It just becomes something, you know, so rather than uh, thinking about how to exploit, how to, um, yeah, just, just get what they want only at the expense of others, how is it we really engage children in a way that allows us to um, allows them to really understand how to uh, you know develop in the world in a way that really creates love and compassion and opportunities for others to survive and thrive as well as the environment. So um, I think it's something like two thousand fourteen. I was at a permaculture teachers, a European permaculture teachers gathering in um, in Slovenia. And while I was there, there were many people who were, you know, talking about most people were talking about adult education. But there was one person there who kept saying, yeah, but what about the children? But what about the children? And so little groups kind of came and started thinking about it and, you know, a few months later, we had the next meeting and and the same story came up. Yeah, but what about the children? And, you know, and I watched this for almost a year and I saw it wasn't really it was it was an idea. There was a huge amount of passion there, but no one really uh, wanting to put that much energy to actually turn it into a project. So um, I ended up meeting this person who who kept asking that question in Finland, which is where she lived and just said all right you want to get this up and running let's let's do it okay it's clearly not happening in this group so let's make it happen and so we organized a project 
and we got people from all over Europe, uh, got some funding, and we started a project called Children in Permaculture, which really started to deeply look at the pedagogical approach to how to bring the permaculture syllabus to different age groups. So, yes, I think it was, yeah, the, the project ran for about three years. And since then, so we now have uh, various books and, you know, uh, websites and collected a huge amount of data and a lot of inspiration and a lot of um, ways in which we can engage. And so, so this is partly informs a lot of the work that I do now um, from this experience. And, um, I don't know, has anyone actually been on the Children in Permaculture training course? No one so far? Okay. Um, yeah, because I mean, I, I don't, I don't run so many myself anymore. I, uh, but there are, I mean, I, I mostly do designing edible landscapes or sorry, yeah, uh, designing um, what we call learnscapes. So designing spaces that lend themselves to children's education. But I, I in, incorporate uh, a lot of the pedagogical stuff from here into it. Um, so, all right. So, yeah. So how do we, you know. All right. So we have we have a standard permaculture design course, shall we say, for adults. How do we how how do we interpret that? How do we need to adjust that? in order to bring it to, let's say, a three to a five-year-old. Yeah, because you can't sit them in a classroom and give them a lecture on ethics and la 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 and teach them about principles and design methodologies and tools. Not gonna happen. It's not there, you know, they're not not there ready for that at that level yet. So what are the things we might need to adjust? to bring about, let's say we're talking about ethics, earth care. How do we, um, yeah, how do, how do we uh, get a child to start considering what earth care is as a three to five year old, let's say. So in the chat, we've got immersion, immerse them, immersing them in the joy of it, forest schools, child led, um, outdoor immersion experiences, working in harmony. Okay, anything else? Design spaces where children can learn by doing, fantastic, by playing, but in this case, playing in the dirt, playing with worms, connecting with nature, exactly. So it's more about experience. Yeah. So rather than lecturing, that's not going to work. It's about experiencing. So what we do, and probably many of you are familiar with the kind of uh, the background to this. I, I'm imagining many of you are probably educators already. Um, but we have we have two two main concepts that we've kind of really highlighted in our in our in our book and on the website, which is. Um, looking at how to engage children in different ways so you know with hands touch feel do you know uh so that the kind of yeah the hand you know the, the physical touching of substances and, and things uh the heart you know the passions the, the the emotions so how to connect uh things through uh yeah through emotional um so yeah through emotions and then the head also how how do they then start thinking about things and i think that model is fairly well known what we've added to that is the eyes okay i mean it's kind of logical it's kind of obvious but seeing things as opposed to just um you know and i guess you could add all of the other senses into that so um and then the other concept that we have is um, is is more around the pedagogical approach to how to uh, get anyone to really understand something, um, and a lot of it, as as people are saying, is it's about experience. 
And the way in which we do it, we, we kind of break it down into three areas, uh, especially for, for children is, uh, but this works with adults as well, is the first thing is this, you know, is it needs to be, uh, all right, let's maybe take one step back as well. Whatever we do, it needs to be, it's, it's much stronger if it is a child-led experience, i.e., rather than saying right everyone this is what we're going to learn today uh and imposing stuff on them that they have no interest on in it's the other way around is to see where is their excitement where is their their attention so this is what we call the seed and and that seed can come uh, either by you initiating it somehow you know i don't know bringing a bringing a bowl full of slugs into the kitchen for example or into the classroom and then seeing the reaction to that you know i mean what kind of a reaction do you imagine you bring a, a bowl full of uh, of slugs into a classroom what, what do you think is going to happen laughter and disgust at the same time uh-huh uh-huh yeah some will just laugh those who are more connected to you know they'll they can resonate with it. Some will be absolutely disgusted, horrified. Uh, what is that? But the key thing is you brought about a reaction. It doesn't matter what the reaction is, but you brought about a reaction. You've got some interest. And what do you think you could then do with that interest? Once you've got a spark, you've got a seed, you've got something to now hang something onto. What could you then do? So, um, yes, yeah, so in the chat, uh, Lisa Marie is saying is, is um, yeah, so that's kind of, that is the kind of sewing. Now you need to grow it. So in our me methodology, yeah, we say seeding, growing, and then harvesting. So seeding is that initial spark, something that brings about a reaction. I say it could have come from the child. It could have, you know, the child on their way to, to you may have seen something or maybe they said something or, you know, uh, maybe they're thinking something, they're hearing, whatever. It doesn't matter where it's come from. It could be that you, as say, have initiated it. But now there's that spark. There's that interest. So now you need to really grow that interest. So how do you think you could grow that interest? Let's, let's carry on with the, the, the slug. Uh, <laughs> um, um, yeah, a scenario. So one, once you've had that reaction, how could you then grow a conversation, a discussion, a thought, or, you know, something about the slugs. Would anyone like to unmute themselves and say? Like asking questions and wondering mm -hmm. what does it come from, for example? Exactly. So it's here, but where should it be living? Where could it be living? Uh, what other questions? Yeah. Keep going. Maybe um, what is different about it and yourself as what, uh -huh. as humans and what is different about it and similar about it? Beautiful. Okay. So what is similar between a slug and a human being? Needs to eat, needs to poo, <laughs> needs to, you know, does it need, it needs company. So mm -hmm. then communicate. So some sort of ideas. So, so then we can start asking, well, what does it eat? Yeah. Where does it get it from? How much does it need to eat? And obviously most people will say, well, the only things let slugs eat are my lettuces. And, um, you know, whatever I grow, that's what they eat. Because, again, people are quite self-centered and they really uh, believe that it's uh, that the whole world is just there for them. And that the slugs don't deserve anything to eat. But actually, they're primary decomposers. They're incredibly, incredibly, incredibly diverse and really useful um, creatures on this planet. And they are essential. Uh, so, but the fact that we have created really artificial environments that allow them to grow uh, really substantially. And, you know, we, I mean, I kind of, I kind of laugh. You know, I see all these people, you know, even within permaculture who, um, you know, 
they do so much to take care of slugs. I mean, it's like, wow, it's so, you really love slugs so much. It's really beautiful to see. Look, you're, you're creating this really most wonderful mulched environment with all this straw so they can live and protect themselves and be away from the, the, work, the, the birds. And, you know, and you create this most, and, you know, where they can reproduce, you create this most magical place where they could live. And then you grow all these things that they can eat and you're feeding them. It's just so beautiful. And you protect them from the, the birds. You know, you put all these um, nets and things over. And it's, ah, oh, <laughs> it's so, lo I mean, it's, it really warms my heart that you care so much for slugs. And, but then, you know, then people say, no, but I don't want, no, they, no, they should be better. We need a, and then they start cussing and complaining about them. But, but you just made the environment for them. Mm -hmm. You know, why are you now complaining? So, um, yeah, so so basically, you know, uh, the, 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 the stage where we can start um, really growing interest, you know, it's it could be done with so many just different questions. But how do you think the the children could answer these questions? How could they answer, you know, how, how can they find out where does a slug actually live? Where, what does it eat or whatever? How do we encourage that, that kind of line of um, finding solutions? So brilliant. So first of all, go outside and observe, observe them in their natural environment. Brilliant. And uh, by looking out for them until they get back to class. Okay. Yep. Yep, exactly. You could be feeding them, you know, while while they're in your classroom, you could be feeding them and taking care of them before you then carefully put them back outside again. <laughs> Love it. So where else can, can they learn some of these ideas from? So observation firsthand, brilliant. Anything else? From a pedagogical perspective, what how would you yeah with a let's say a three to seven year old what what would you be doing to um you know are you going to get them on the internet and start looking it up you know type it into Google or Chat GPT and say oh tell me well, actually there probably are some seven year olds who could do that better than I could but anyway <laughs> um, I've been going to explore so take them to different places and see where do you see the slug exactly and tell stories so the way that i've i've done it in the past is uh, so one of the projects we had is um i had i literally just had a couple of hours with these kids but we wanted to make a insect habitat an insect hotel and they were uh, five and six year olds and um so the first thing I did is I just told stories about three different types of insects. Uh, I can't remember now, maybe a ladybird, a lacewing, and I'm not sure what the other one was now. Uh, maybe an ear, no, not an earwig, but um, uh, wood lice or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but, but I told little stories I just made up about where they live, what they eat, what they do, who their friends are, and and things like this, you know, just nice little stories to get them, get their imaginations going. And then I planted lots of materials around the garden. And they said, right, so now we need to go and make a, an insect hotel for them. So let's, let's, you know, and then they ran, oh my God, look, look, I found this, I found this. Oh, and, you know, this absolute excitement, you know, of, of, of discovering all these things that we could then use. And then they, honestly, they built probably one of the best insect habitats I've seen, insect hotels, much better than the adults, because they were thinking like the insects. So quite often what you see with uh, with adults is they they make them look really good, but they are just so completely, totally, absolutely impractical. And no insects will ever come and live in them, but they look good. And then they place them in always guarantee you 90% of all insect hotels are pointing in the wrong direction. And uh, 
and wherever I go, it's always, you know, kind of in the northern hemisphere, it's always on the north side. And when you ask why, oh, because it fits there, nothing else grows there, so we put it there. Yeah, but that's also where the insects are not going to come, you know. And But by telling the stories to the children, the children understand that, you know, when they're living in their little hole, the only way they know it's time to get up and to go out and, um, you know, go and find some food is when the sun hits your front door and which way does the sun hit the front door you know and then they just kind of work out well where's the sun coming from oh, it's coming from over there so if we put it over there in the shade are you going to wake up no you're not going to wake up so you're going to be asleep all day long all year long so would you bother making a, a house over there probably not so you know even the kids can can kind of work this out and then think about where to even place it so so yeah, so um, exactly. And by telling stories, you help them to develop some kind of empathy. And, you know, and with the stories, the way that I work anyway, is it's really about imagination and really getting them to, to be the slug, to be the insect, to be the animal. And let's face it, kids, are, you don't need to give them an invitation to do that. They will do that anyway. And uh it's, you know, but I do this also with adults. When I teach people how to make a forest garden, I get them to be the trees. I get them to be the ground cover plants. I get them to be the climbers. I get them to be all the different, you know, elements in a forest garden so that they can feel what is it like? Am I in the right place? Am I, is my heart really going to sing if I am left here? Am I going to get enough sun? Am I going to get enough nutrients? Am I going to get enough um, water? Am I getting all the things I need for me to really be happy and thrive and therefore give fruit or not? And so, yes, the more you can use this imagination and really get uh, get uh, uh, young people or adults even to really start feeling and thinking and behaving like animals and insects, uh, the more empathy they have, the more they understand them. Um and I don't know, maybe if people are interested, we could also talk about another really exceptional exercise, which is maybe for, yeah, I, I guess, actually, you know, I have done it with younger kids as well. But has anyone ever done the work, uh, the reconnects? Do people know about the work that reconnects? Joanna Macy? Yeah, George is a big thumb butt up. And in particular, um, the Council of All Beings. Have you done the Council of All Beings? Wow, what a beautiful exercise. Um, would, would it be okay if we go on a little exercise and just uh, just kind of look at that for a little while? Just give it, yeah, maybe 10, 15 minutes. So, yeah. So, Momo, Momo Free uh, seems to like it. Um, wow, where to begin? Um, so, this came from... I have to say, for the work that reconnects was a really magical. Um, it was a tool that came to me at exactly the right time for me, because up to then I was a really angry activist, you know, shouting and screaming at anyone and everything about you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, the British government, uh, the, you know, this corporation, that corporation and, you know, just shouting and screaming and telling the world that they were wrong and getting into a lot of trouble um because of it and uh and getting really really angry because of it and and then i kind of started to realize that i was defining myself by what i was against rather than what i was for and you know so what was i, I knew what i didn't want to see in the world but what was i doing that was right in the world and what was i doing to encourage others to do you know the right things as a as opposed to trying to persuade a corporation to stop behaving so unethically which let's face it there's no chance that's going to happen so what was I doing that was realistic what was I personally doing that was actually bringing about a better world and um and so the work that reconnects came along really at the perfect time to show me that actually this anger that I had inside of me actually came from love and compassion because I could see how beautiful this world could be 
and all these people and corporations who are doing things against that is who I was angry with. You know, and um, and I say, and I and because I was surrounding myself by other people who were also angry. That was making me even more angry and things that I didn't know I was angry about. They were then introduced. And then all of a sudden I was also angry about things that they were telling me to be. Angry. And it was just like really, really, really destructive. But I say all of a sudden through the work that reconnects, I realized actually this anger came from love and compassion. So what the work that helped me to really think about is how can I now turn this into something positive? How can I take that anger, that recognition that things aren't going so well, and turn it into a practice, something that could really change things around and actually make a difference? And um, you know, I'll, I'll leave you to explore the whole the whole program. But in really really short, there's a you know it's it's a four stage kind of cyclical uh, practice where the first thing you is just you know appreciations gratitudes where you really just appreciate what is already going well all the amazing things that are in your life or in your garden or in your country or in your environment or wherever whatever area you want to concentrate on uh then um then you start looking at what the challenges are so what's what's the actual reality of what's really going on and um and then you move into the third phase which is then seeing well how can we see this differently what is it we can actually do about it you know how do we see the world through new eyes um and then the fourth part is what is the practice or the 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 the, the thing that we are going to do to actually make a difference and change so what what you know so it's going forth what is it we're actually going to do to change this situation and as I say, and there's lots and lots and lots of different tools that you have in each of those areas. Uh, so you can explore so many different things in so many different ways. But that pattern is always the same. Uh, what's going well? What is the problem? How can we solve it? What are we actually going to do? And um, and so the, the third part, seeing through new eyes, one of the ways of doing that is through this council of all beings. And I've done this in so many different places. Um, and it's it, and every time it's just really, really beautiful. It can be really deep. People can get quite upset uh, through it because what we do is we get everyone to take on an entity. So to become a character, you know, so one is one person could be wind. Another person could be air, uh, um, water a plant, a tree, you know, a slug, a mosquito, earthworms, bees, um, whatever. So everyone takes on an entity, you know, birds, foxes, this, that, and the other. So, um, and the way that I like to do it is I like to get everyone into character and create a mask and start getting into character and start talking to each other and meeting each other as that character and really starting to get to know about each other well who's eating who 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 does what in the ecosystem and um and i say really getting them to really start living that character so that during the the main part of it is you know the the kind of um the, the core of it is to then get them into a council where each of them expresses what their joys are and i mean this is my way of doing it anyway is expressing you know all the you know, the respect and love and compassion that they have for all the other entities in the room and just talking about the relationships that they have uh, between each other uh, so that we really get to see that yeah if if any of us are missing from the ecosystem there's a problem we all bring something really magical to this world and and you know and even though some may eat others i think there was a, a worm that sat next to a bird a few weeks ago, the last time I did it in Hungary. And um, and the bird was, do you mind if I just, you know, can someone else sit in the middle? Because, you know, even though the bird looks kind of friendly, uh, I'd rather not take the risk. So they just sat a couple of people <laughs> aside. And uh, I mean, they were really into character. And um, 
And then I invite them to think about, um, okay, what are some of the challenges that you're facing in the world? And invariably, it comes back to things that humans are doing. You know, so things that humans have done that have impacted their ability to really thrive. So water, for example, might say, well, um, it really hurts me, bird, that when you come and drink from me, I would really love to be able to give you the beautiful, clean water that you need to thrive so that you can go and sing your beautiful songs. But unfortunately, these two-legged friends have been pouring all these chemicals into me. They're making my water. And as much as I try and try and try to clean myself, they're pouring so much into my system that I'm really struggling. And I can see how that's affecting you. And it really saddens me to think that I cannot take care of you. And, you know, and everyone speaks in this kind of way, just exploring, exper you know, explaining what's really going on in their world, uh, you know, and the, the, the challenges that they're facing. And um, and then the, the final round, the way that I do it again is is to to kind of say, well, you know, not, not all of these two legged friends are, uh, you know, are exploitative. You know, there's quite a few out there who are really are trying to do their best to change things around. What advice would you give them? What is it that you could say that would really help you to thrive? What are the things that they could do that would help bring about a change for you personally? And so again, everyone expresses, well, if, you know, uh, so fungi, well, you know, this, this habit of the two-legged friends sweeping up all of the leaves and all the twigs on the ground so that my mycelium can't grow and spread, you know, I would really love to share, you know, to pick up nutrients from here and exchange it and exchange it with different plants and things. And, and I can't do that because they keep clearing the ground. So my advice would be, could you just leave the leaves, leave the twigs, leave the organic matter on the ground so that I can grow and I can do my work. And in this way, everyone starts expressing it. So people really get to understand how the whole ecosystem comes together. And then, you know, then I, I carry on and do a few things after that where people actually get a chance to, um, you know, you come out of the, the circle, out of the, the conference, the, the actual uh, council, and you express yourself still in character. And then we take the masks off and then people express themselves back as themselves again. Uh <laughs> I remember one time doing this in Cyprus in a public space. Uh, it was a, um, it was not totally public. It was a, um, it was a huge conference on health and well-being. And uh, what do they call it? Heart, um, what's the buzzword? It's, it's not a new buzzword. Uh, heart and soul. Uh, anyway, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, one of these, you know, fancy kind of um, lots of yoga type people. Um, uh, you know, with their leotards and the, the kind of that that form of yoga, um, as opposed to real yoga, um, and but yeah, but it was literally it was packed. You know, there was six seven hundred people, and so we did this outside in a big hall in a big uh, courtyard, and everyone started making masks and things. And then this I don't know six seven year old came along, so oh, can I join in? And uh, so we explained to him and his mother what we were doing. And I said, yeah, you're absolutely welcome to come and join us. And um, and so so we said, all right, can you pick something, you know, that the, what, what, what would you like to be? And he said, I want to be a lion. Um, is it possible maybe you pick something that you're more likely to see in Cyprus, you know, that you're more likely to see uh as part of the ecosystem here in cyprus rather than a lion you know and there's me thinking oh maybe he'll be a cat or something huh? he said so i want to be a fly <laughs> so we went from a lion to being a fly and he was the most incredible fly every time he expressed himself he really he really was the fly it was really incredible and um and, you know, and, and at the end, the when when we came, we were still in character. So we'd come out of the 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 um, 
the the, the meeting and you know the, the council and we were expressing ourselves still in character and everyone's saying what they felt and he just said um i just want to say that i'm really sorry sorry what are you sorry for he said I know as a fly, you know, I'm just going about doing my things, but I know I really annoy people. And I just wanted to say I'm really sorry. <laughs> it was so sweet. And then <laughs> then after he left, uh, a few people who, who were there, they said, um, you know, um, when we saw this kid arriving, we thought, oh, my God, this this is going to be a disaster. This this kid is just going to spoil it. This is a serious thing we're trying to do. And this kid is just going to destroy it. But they said, you know what? He came with so much authenticity. He just, he was the best. He was, he was, he was absolutely was the fly. And he really expressed himself for, for what he needs in the world. And what he needed to really thrive and the challenge, he really was magical. So, um, yeah, I've got lots of little stories like that where where it really, it really deeply, deeply, deeply changes how you see the world. And I think this is the most common uh, thing that people say afterwards is how it's the first time they have, you know, since maybe childhood, you know, the first time in, in uh, yeah in adulthood that they've actually really pretended to be something else, to or and it's the first time they could they've really gotten an opportunity to understand the world through another entity's perspective. You know, so what it really is like to be a bird, what it's really like to be water to be a tree, to be fungi, to be a mosquito, to be a slug, to be a mouse, to, you know, and um, and how joyful it can be to be those entities. But at the same time, you know, because of fear, because of problems that humans are doing, uh, it can also be extremely challenging. So to put people into that position, to really feel it, it develops compassion. It develops an, an understanding of other things other than yourself. And hopefully this can also be extrapolated to also um, understanding other people, not just other entities, but also understanding that not all people are the same and that every, you know, and, and we still need to have this same kind of compassion uh, and this same kind of understanding. And the only way you can really understand is to really, um, yeah, try to experience being, you know, in someone else's shoes. So as I say, so for me, this is, it's, you know, it's a really easy thing to do. It's a really beautiful exercise, you know, as I say, kids real well, you know, their their response to this is is really magical. It's really much easier than you imagine. It's it's up to you how deep you would want to go, depending on the age group, depending on on the the the, the group you have. But it's a really, um, yeah, it's a really meaningful experience. So I think we've got maybe uh, another twenty five minutes to go. Um, so let me just start wrapping up and then inviting questions and what have you and see where we go from there. So the key thing that I was really trying to get across is, um, you know, the the, the challenge, main challenges we have in the world is really, uh, you know, is is the loss of biodiversity is this and this and, you know, the the disrespect that humans pay towards nature and how they really believe that they are superior and that they can manipulate and use and exploit. And so this is the main, one of the main things we need to, to, to try and overcome and to replace that with love and understanding. So understanding of other entities, other, you know, different bits of nature, even, you know, yucky kind of slugs and mosquitoes, which many people may really dis loathe or despise, or rats or mice or whatever, but uh, but actually they all have a really valuable part to play in the ecosystem. So how do we begin to understand them? How do we begin to show love and compassion towards them? 
and um yeah and how do we um yeah so, so how do how is it that we can kind of keep that love uh so that when people start to make decisions for what they do in the world you know whenever they make a decision about what they are about to do whether it's building something whether it's growing something whether it's how they feed themselves whether it's a job a vocation whatever choices you need to make in life how do you do it in a way that um, really brings richness and abundance uh, to everything and everyone? And for me, the permaculture framework really does this well. And so, but obviously with the different age groups, we need to really think more carefully, how is it we bring about that level of uh, understanding for how to behave? So for example, when we're I don't know introducing something like ethics to to children. We can't do it intellectually. It needs to be a lived experience. So when you see a child that that really carefully picks up a slug from the pathway and puts it into the the green, you know, into your lettuces or something or whatever, uh, is to really recognise and say, "Wow, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much." And it's not necessarily rewarding. It's not a carrot and stick style, but but really just saying, hey, I recognized that you did something really beautiful just then. You did something because you cared for that and you didn't want it to get run over by the bicycles. And so. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so so we have. Um, I don't have them with me right now, but we have um, like some badges, Earth Care, People Care, Fair Share badges with kind of child friendly kind of images on it. And and so, you know, so we can move these around. If if we see someone doing something, we can kind of, you know, put that badge in, in you know, in their direction or something and say, yeah, you can wear that badge if you want, you know, uh, just because we recognize you did something really beautiful. However it is, but it's, it's just about... Um, you know, or it could be that if you're in a scenario where there is a challenge of some sort, is you could um, invite them to think, OK, if we were to apply earth care to this or people care to this or fair share to this scenario, how could we have done this differently? So let's not blame each other. Let's not uh, get into he did this, she did that. No. How could we do it differently next time? that re results in a more positive outlook. And so, yeah, so to really, you know, to think and to really um, embody, embody these changes and and to, yeah, and uh, George has put harvest. So to really make a point that this is what has happened and this is the harvesting, you know, this is what we have learnt. This is what we're getting from this. So this is the how we can change our uh, behavior in a way that actually makes this richer and better for everyone else. So, yeah, so that that kind of. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the last few things maybe I'll say is, yes, yeah, so it's, it's about how do we I say bring in that kind of um, that kind of approach where we're really. Um, yeah, looking at how to plant those seeds, how to grow and how to harvest. Uh, but how do we do it in many different ways, as I say, through, um, you know, hands, heart, uh, eyes and and head, you know. So what are the different methodologies that we could do it? And what we have, if you look at our Children in Permaculture website, is there's a whole, there's something like 800 odd inspirations for activities where you can say, um, OK, I want a, a head way of uh, explaining the water cycle. And you do that. and it's got a few things that you can think of that. Well, have a think of this, have a think of that. Maybe this could be a way you could do it. And so we've got about 800 to say inspirations for activities. So you can um, yeah, just play around and explore those. So it's just children in permaculture dot com. I can type it in in a moment if you like. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's really about making it fun, making it child led, child centered. So allow them, if where possible, to come up with the inspiration to to you know plant the, their own seeds and really 
you know, so all you're doing is you're creating like this scaffolded kind of approach where you have a, you know, you have a framework of, you know, that these are the things you want to achieve, but allow the children to work out how to use that scaffolding. You know, at what point, you know, where is their starting point? How do you evolve it? Um, and how do you help them to harvest to understand what they've done? So, um, yeah, I think I'd like to open it up to, to questions and or feedback or, or whatever people want. Yeah, we've got about 15 minutes, so. I must admit, I'm I'm really I'm dyslexic, so I really struggle to read things. So I'm, I don't read things very quickly. So if there are things, if there are questions in there that people have thrown that I haven't seen, please, please, please do let me know. But yeah, Momo. If yeah, it's, name. yeah. Hi. It's not really a question. It's just a thank you and um, a little story I put in the chat um, recently mm -hmm. this year. When I'm I'm. Um, I'm at a home where the people live here half the time and then I come the rest of the time. And so they're here in the summer. And when I got here, there were all these fly swatters everywhere in the house. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I took the fly swatters and I was like, mm, I don't know about this, but um, as it started getting colder, the flies started coming in and they were literally like flying around a lot around my head and my face and everything. And I thought, okay, this is the challenge. I get to put away all the fly swatters and let them like literally land on me and do whatever they want, and do, you know, teach me what they have to teach me. And it's been amazing. I it, actually, they come to meetings uh, on Zoom and they sit on the camera and, <laughs> <laughs> and show up. And um, they've been teaching me a lot. So, um, and I feel that way being here with you sharing the stories and um if anyone ever wants to share that story <laughs> feel free <laughs> beautiful thank you so much for sharing that anyone else either yeah i mean happily if there's more stories if there's more ways in which perhaps you've engaged children in in such a way or um yeah anything we've got 15 minutes so share away evie um... evie is it Eve, yeah, Evie. Also, yeah. Eve. I like Evie more. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so I have heard uh, many times uh, one of the struggles are like um, also getting the parents go along with this idea mm -hmm. of kids being yeah. outside. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering what is your um, method or give us some tricks. I don't know, because that, I think yeah. that's one of the biggest challenges. So if we're looking at parents for taking parents outside, uh, that is, there, there's several challenges there. First of all, maybe they're not comfortable to be outside. Maybe they just don't have the time to take children outside. So that's more difficult. But uh, what's easier is uh, is in the classroom, so with schools. So, um, so if you already have a group, uh, to actually get them outside uh, together collectively is actually much easier because obviously each parent, I don't know all of their different uh, the, the different challenges. So there could be a thousand reasons as to why. Um, so I, I don't I can't don't have a generic answer for that because there's so many different challenges there. Um, and uh, whereas in school where where they are together, so the biggest obstacle we find is actually the teachers. So the teachers, because quite often the teachers are not uh, so uh, comfortable being outside and because of their experience of how they handle the children in the classroom, they think, wow, if I take them outside, they're going to be even more unruly and even more distracted. And what we can show is that is absolutely not the case. It's actually quite totally the reverse. Um, I remember one time I was working with a group and uh, I think it was about 60 kids we had for some reason and um, and I had to take them outside and we were, I was asked, right, I had three hours with them and they had to design a garden and there were three of us facilitating plus uh, three observers um, and so, so I, I got them outside and the first thing is... Uh, 
I could see it was their first time outside for a while and they were raring to go and they were like, there's no way I could keep control of them. There's no way I could keep them and say anything to them. So literally just on the spur of the moment, I just invented a game where they had to run and do stuff. I don't even remember what I told them to do, but just blah, 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 everything here, there and everywhere. And it was chaos. Blah. And then right, 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 right. Okay, everyone, 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 back, 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 back. Oof. A total, absolute, complete silence and attention. And they were like, what's next? What's next? And it, and the, the observer who was watching me said she's never seen anything like that in her life. Like so many kids in an instant come back and just completely, right, okay, okay, this guy's fun. Um, what, what have you got for us next? And um, And so... Yeah, you work with the energy of the group. You work with the energy of the children. And if the energy is scattered and it is, blah, you work with that. Don't try to suppress that because it's, you know, allow that to happen and then you you work with them. So um, I'm going to come to you in a second, George. Um, so, yeah, so what we need to show, uh, in fact, another story is... Uh, in Romania, once we the the headmistress invited me into their their school, and you could hear all the teachers grumbling. Oh my God, what's she up to now? Like, what she's she's going to make us do something else? And outside, no, we can't take kids outside. It's like, uh -huh. and you know, and and you could literally the 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 energy of the room was really bad. You know, the the the, pe the teachers really did not want to do this. I spent two hours with the parent, with the with the teachers, and going through different things, and you know, in a really fun way, and really getting them really excited about doing stuff, and you know, and it's saying, right, so how how is it you could explain mathematics outside? What is it you could do? What is it we could do to change the the garden in such a way that you could teach this and teach that, and uh, and how could you play this game? And it, and we created all these amazing different uh, scenarios. And then I went back, I think, about four weeks later, and the one teacher who was probably the most sceptical and complaining the most, literally, no lie, as I walked into the garden, she was there with like a loop and saying, see this, look, 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 hey, hey, come, come, come. And literally, she was like a little kid, yeah, bringing the other kids, I right, have a look at this, look, see that one. This is... And, you know, and she was so excited, so the kids were excited. And um, so, yes, yeah, so it's how to how to get that excitement and that uh, energy. And what for sure, another trick is uh, it needs to come from them. As opposed to it coming from you telling them this is what you must do. So the way that I did it, uh, this was a group in the Netherlands. There was... Um, Again, we had about 20 teachers, uh, all of whom were extremely sceptical about taking children outside. I think there was one or two who were kind of excited. The rest were extremely sceptical. And so what we did is I used this tool that I use called Margolia's Wheel, where you have, imagine five people sitting in a circle uh, facing outwards, and then one person in front of each of those. So you've got five people in the middle, five people in front of them and they would have a one-to-one -one conversation about something about an idea and then two minutes later they would move so they were in front of someone else and they would carry on that conversation and you go around in a circle so that um, each person is spoken to five people in one round and and then I have two or three questions that I go through and they build up ideas and I did this in two separate groups so one circle of 10 people another circle of 10 people and then I got them to feedback and what was really incredible because they could hear each other a little bit is the two solutions that the two groups made were absolutely identical so even though they never talked to each other the two separate groups because of how the tool works uh, just through one-on-one -on -one conversations they built up a um yeah, they, they built up a scenario of things that they were really excited by and they evolved. They created the solution. And 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 sure enough, you know, now they've got the energy to do it, they're going to do it. 
and um you know because it came from them as opposed to someone else imposing it on them so george you've had your hand up for a while so go for it my friend uh thanks prakash i just wanted to share a brief uh, story it, that um, totally supports what you just said so i was today at the school uh, early in the morning planting um a green fence with um, some children that mostly I, uh, I still don't know and so they don't know me. They have seen me a couple of times there preparing the ground. And I was um, uh, organizing this thing with the headmistress and the other educators of the school, thinking that probably they would, um, the children would rely more on adults they already uh, knew. And it was not like that. So I was amazed because they feel they felt totally comfortable with me, even not knowing me before. And they, I just left them um, finding their own ways. Just gave them some in, instructions before, and they were like self-organizing themselves and sharing their experience with the with the um, the kids that were arriving after them. And they were totally precise doing they were planting some shrubs uh, and I was just watching them and being amazed because they were brilliant and um, yeah and and I, I, I learned a lot watching them actually <laughs> and um, yes and another thing it was this was the brief um, story and another thing I would like to share is more like a question to you uh, if you would uh, recommend uh, what would you recommend as next steps for people would that would like to to deepen this knowledge about uh, working with children based on permaculture for people uh, like educators or uh, like me that are, am already inside the permaculture mm -hmm. movement and uh, work with children so i'd like to deep to deepen more um, this experience not just doing things but maybe um, a, a attaining more knowledge from people mm -hmm. that are already working since so for a longer time okay so first of all just to to feedback on your your story yeah that's really beautiful so there's this whole idea you know that um you know we have this saying that each one teach one so the more you can get uh someone to teach someone else something you know um <clears throat> the the levels of confidence in that person who is now expressed you know they've maybe have only learned it this morning but they're teaching someone else the the if you think about the pedagogical you know what's going on in someone's mind to actually have to explain something to someone else they have to know it they have to be confident they have to work out how do i express this in a clear way and so the, the 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 depth of learning in themselves from expressing it and explaining it to someone else is really, really, really important. So the more in your projects that you actually get the kids to teach other kids, you know, the stronger that they will learn. It's not just kids, adults as well. It's I rely on this a lot in my form of education is uh, by constantly asking questions, getting people into groups to help each other to work things out. And um, and so, yeah, so that's really beautiful. But in terms of, um, yeah, how to move forward, um, I mean, as I say, through the Children in Perm Culture Network, we have various workshops. I can always organise workshops as well. So you can contact me and we can organise either online or... Um, or if there's a group of you in a place that I'm traveling around Europe continuously. So uh, anyone who, uh, if you want a, an in-person course, I think Lisa Maria would like to organize something um, down her way at some point. So if anyone's in London and um, I see you, you have to leave as well. So um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, so we can organize either in-person workshops or online workshops. But I think what really moves it to the next level is then to create little support groups. So having learnt it, 
to then just go away and have to figure it out yourself. This isn't how I work. Uh, as you know, anyone who studies with me, in fact, we've got one tonight, anyone who studies with me joins this Roots and Permaculture Network, uh, which is like a study circle. Um, and regularly, like in an hour and a half's time, we're going to start on the next one, which is just uh, everyone coming together just to, you know, ask questions, say, hey, yeah, I want to know about this, or I, I need to make a grey water treatment system. Can someone help me? Oh, I've just learned this. Oh, this is really exciting. I'd really love to share this with you. Or I'm making a design. I need some help. Whatever it is, you know. Uh, so for me, once we've, the advantage of doing the course with me personally is I create that network, which the, the general roots of the children permaculture network isn't so good at doing. Um, whereas the, the courses that I do, I make sure people join. And you join a network not just of other people doing children in permaculture stuff but people doing other permaculture things permaculture forest gardening people who studied sociopathy collaborative decision making i do health and well-being so like a holistic life design courses i'm a qualified homeopath and a lay naturopath and so we bring health and well-being which is the course that lucy came to india to come and do um which is really really amazing um so yes yeah, so everyone is in the same pot everyone is welcome to come in and join uh and so we can support each other long after the course years after the course there's people in this network who've been here for 10 years in this network and they still show up and they still share their experiences with each other and and learn from each other so for me that's the most logical way to really move forward is to create these uh networks of people taking care of each other so I need to go as well. There's someone banging on my door. I think they might be trying to connect my gas supply so I can actually have a little bit of warmth and actually cook something. So I better go. Amazing, really Okesh. Thank you. So love everyone. Yeah, if you need Thank any you, help, Akesh. reach out, you just send me Thank messages. Um, Thanks so much, everyone. All right, lots of love. Bye. Enjoy. Take care.